Hold that thought. So guys, most of us have the best intentions to eat better, cut back on takeout, make home-cooked meals, but really, it doesn't happen, especially during a pandemic. With today's unpredictable times, even a trip to the grocery store can be stressful. Enter Gobble, a meal kit delivery service designed for real life. It's easy, it's delicious, and it's a great way to create a healthy meal routine that's personalized for your busy lifestyle. And I have a really good deal to get you guys started. With Gobble, no matter how crazy your schedule is, you can still get a nutritious, flavorful, homemade dinner on the table because it only takes 15 minutes, truly. And there's no menu planning, no shopping, no crazy prep time required. Gobble has an army of sous chefs who do the time-consuming work for you. They pre-portion and prep the fresh, high-quality ingredients, they create spice blends, and they simmer the perfect sauces. All you have to do is pick meals from Gobble's extensive dinner menu each week. They have a huge variety of flavors, classic dishes, global recipes, vegetarian options, and even a line of lean and clean recipes that are low-cal and low-carb. Here's how it works. The Gobble Box is delivered fresh right to your doorstep, and it's ready to serve in just 15 minutes. According to Business Insider, it's the easiest meal kit I've ever tried, and it tastes great too. Plus, it's not a big commitment. You can skip delivery weeks or cancel the service at any time. All right, so here comes the offer. Gobble is offering you guys, as Infertile AF listeners, an awesome limited time deal. Six meals for just $36 plus free shipping. That's dinner for two for three nights for just $36. To get this special offer now, go to gobble.com slash infertile AF. That's gobble.com slash infertile AF for six meals for just $36. Do it, guys. Gobble it up. Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile AF, the podcast. This is episode 105 called Rachel. I'm so thrilled to tell you guys about today's sponsor, Extend Fertility. Extend Fertility was founded on the premise that democratizing egg freezing could ultimately change the fertility industry and deliver better results. Their co-founder, Dr. Joshua Klein, was actually my doctor. And as you may have heard me say when I interviewed him in episode 36 of this podcast, He's brilliant and supportive and overall awesome. Dr. Klein observed that IVF's success rate was low for women over 40 and its high cost was disappointing for doctors and patients alike. Dr. Klein saw the opportunity to help women think more proactively about their fertility. He believed that if more women could access their younger eggs during the IVF process, more women would see successful outcomes. He founded Extend Fertility, which began offering egg freezing at 40% below the national average cost. By 2017, they were the largest egg freezing practice in the nation, and today, they've expanded to offer a full range of infertility services, including IVF in a small practice environment that is more personal, higher quality, and data-driven. To make an appointment or to see more, go to extendfertility.com and tell them Infertile AF sent you. Thanks, Extend. Hey guys, so let me tell you about today's guest, Rachel. It's an interesting story because Rachel has not yet embarked on her trying to conceive journey, her TTC journey. However, she is infertile and I kind of want her to explain it to you guys in her own words. I don't want to give too much away, but she is young. She's 26 and she emailed me because she thought that she had a story that we hadn't shared yet and she's right. We haven't. So I am going to let her tell you guys all about what happened when she had a surgery for something she thought was minor and woke up with her life completely changing. So I will leave it at that, but I just wanted to thank Rachel for sharing this with us. And without further ado, this is Rachel's infertility story. Rachel. Hey girl. Hi Allie. How are you? How are you? I'm I'm good. good. I'm so (laughs) glad to finally talk to you. I have to tell the listeners that the reason that we connected is because you sent me a DM and 
I did. Flattery will get you everywhere with me. <laughs> and in the first paragraph, you're like, I just want to let you know that you're a bad bitch and I admire you greatly. And I was like, <laughs> okay, this girl is, I was, I'm calling her. So thank you for saying that. But tell me why you wrote to me in the first place and what's, what happened to you at age 23? I guess we could start with. Yeah. So, and I have to say just with uh, my, my message, I was, I was only telling the truth, but <laughs> basically, I'll, I'll just start from from the beginning. So just to give you an, an overview of my backstory, my entire life, to be honest, was pretty great. I never really had anything traumatic happen. I never had any medical issues until I was 23. Mm-hmm. And how it all started, have you ever heard of, which I don't know why you would, but have you ever heard of the State Fair of Texas? I haven't, but it sounds fun. <laughs> It is. They like fried Oreos Um, and stuff? Yes, exactly. So that's kind of where it all began. I was going to the state fair. It's kind of a big deal Mm -hmm. in in Texas. We we would go every year growing up because it's in Dallas where I'm from. And basically the objective, uh, at least for me personally, is to eat like as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So they, (laughs) they fry, I mean, really anything. They have fried butter. They have fried Oreos. (laughs) <laughs> they truly fry anything. So I go to this and I ate probably 30,000 calories. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I, I actually ate something called a heart attack burger. Was, oh no. Yeah. So I go home that night and I am throwing up. Oh I God. Think, I think that I have food poisoning, which of course I ate a heart attack burger. I'm probably... Right. I'm probably ill from that. Like as advertised. <laughs> yes, exactly. They do not um, lie. Yeah. So I I think that I have food poisoning and this goes on all through the night and I'm having really bad stomach pain and it just is progressively getting worse. So eventually I call my mom, who's a nurse, who's amazing. And I'm basically like, hey, I think I'm dying. Can you come over? And we end up going to an urgent care first. Mm -hmm. And they say, hey, you definitely have appendicitis. You should go to the emergency room and get that taken out. So then we go to the emergency room and they just really can't figure out what's going on. But they think it's either appendicitis or a ruptured ovarian cyst. And so basically, I ended up going under for a laparoscopy. And they just said, you know, if it's your appendix, we'll take that out. If it's the cyst, we'll get that fixed up. So either way, it's going to be very, um, very chill. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Were you Um, freaking out at all going under? Well, I was on drugs. So Mm -hmm. at that point, so I don't really remember a lot. I was on like pain medication, but... Honestly, no. I uh-huh. really, I really thought that it was just my appendix, and a lot of people get that taken out. So, I, for some reason, I wasn't worried or scared at all. Okay. I actually was texting my boss, telling him that I would be at work tomorrow. So I really thought nothing was wrong. I was like, "Hey, I'm getting my appendix taken out, I think, but I will be at work. So, I'll see you guys soon." Mm-hmm. Well, that was, you know, not the case. I the surgery I think took like eight or nine hours mm-hmm. when it was supposed to take maybe three. Wow. And instead of yeah, instead of waking up with something minor, I woke up with stage three ovarian cancer. And it I mean that's when I found out after it was all said and done. So I woke up, I had a full hysterectomy oh uh, and a debulking surgery. And that was basically it. <laughs> it wow. Kind of yeah, it was so said and done. What happened when you were under? Obviously, they probably had to go ask your mom permission or something like that. Or like, how did that shake out? Yeah. So they went in for the laparoscopy and which is basically just exploratory, you know, surgery. They go in and, and look around. Mm-hmm. And when they, when they looked, <laughs> there was just cancer everywhere. It had basically made a breeding ground of my reproductive system and wow. my ovaries looked like shit and that I really don't know too much about what happened. I just know that it was really bad. They pulled my parents, my family and said, Hey, this is what we need to do. Of course I had signed paperwork 
beforehand saying, do what you got to do. But right, right. Oh my God. My so- surgeon actually was the same doctor that birthed me. Wow. So I've known her my entire life. So mm-hmm. she's very close with my mom as well. And she basically said, this is, we need to do a hysterectomy. Basically, like, to, to save her life, we need to do this. Yeah, exactly. I so think that they, that's more or less you, what she said. Did you have any symptoms of the cancer or was, or like when you were getting sick, were you mm-hmm. really sick? Did they just find the cancer by happenstance or was it because of the cancer that you were feeling sick and you had to have the surgery? Does that make sense? <laughs> Yes. So I've had other I, people, other friends before who went in for something else and then they discovered cancer when they opened them up and thankfully they saved it that way, you know? Yeah. So my sickness was completely unrelated to my cancer. Gotcha. Okay. So I just got lucky. Okay. Um, I just had basically like a stomach bug, <laughs> a really bad stomach bug. Wow. And so they just found it by chance, but As far as symptoms, I honestly don't know if I had symptoms. And that's kind of the thing about ovarian. They call it the silent killer because a lot of symptoms go unnoticed. And they can be things that everyone experiences, like Mm -hmm. basically period symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I, I hadn't really had any symptoms that I noticed. I had always had weird periods. So I I didn't know what to look out for. Right. I had a friend who got in an accident and had to have surgery on something minor. And when they opened him up, they found cancer. And the doctor apparently said, do you know the number one way we figure out people have cancer? Car accidents. No way. I was like, what? That's crazy. Yeah. My, I mean, mine was basically like eating too many corn dogs. Right. So. Heart attack burger. <laughs> yeah. Heart attack burger. I'm glad I ate it looking back. But yeah, I I had no idea. But I I did have a, a minor, minor surgery two years before. And there was nothing on the whatever scans I had. I had a hernia. And there was nothing at that time. So they okay, know so that they, it developed. Yeah. So they probably would have seen something at that point. Yeah. Okay. So what happened when you woke up? I remember I my the lower half of my body was so numb that for some reason the first thing I thought was that they had removed both of my legs. Um I was obviously on a lot of of drugs at this point just waking up from surgery. And I basically just said, you know, what was it? <laughs> what happened? And they explained to me that they had found cancer everywhere. I had a hysterectomy. And it was also on my abdominal lining as well, which was kind of like the the bad part mm-hmm. of it or the worst of it. Mm-hmm. And that was really it. They When I initially woke up, they said, okay, you're starting chemo in a few weeks and we will go from there. So even um, after the full hysterectomy, you had to do chemo. So I ended up not having to do chemotherapy, but it was a pretty hot debate amongst my doctors and amongst like the tumor board, which I guess is where they discuss cases. Mm -hmm. My diagnosis was stage three epithelial borderline ovarian cancer. And borderline cancer is basically kind of in between malignant or it's like low malignancy in between malignant and benign. Okay. So it really just depends on where it's spread to. Mm-hmm. Malignant um, is bad, right? Yes. Malignant means just bad. To clarify. Benign means, yeah. Yeah. And they just didn't, it's kind of a gray area. They it's not super common, so they don't know a ton about it. And they didn't know if chemotherapy would be necessary or effective for my type of cancer. And also I was otherwise healthy. Mm -hmm. So it was just going to make me sick and I didn't have any cancer in my body anymore. So they didn't know if it was necessary. So thankfully I ended up not having to have chemotherapy, which is great because I, that would have been not fun. Right. Um, So tell me about when you, after the surgery and this had happened, and then were you immediately, did they talk about your fertility at all or how that was going to you know, affect the rest of your life basically? Yeah. So I remember asking the doctors, that was one of the first things that I asked. I 
I'd always seen myself having getting married and having a family. And so I remember asking, can I still have kids? <laughs> and they they basically just said no. Mm. And I remember asking, is there anything I can do? Can we freeze my eggs? And it was too late, which I always tell people that my eggs were rotten mm. because they they didn't, they weren't salvageable. Yeah. And yeah, they basically just said no, but that's that's really all that I got. And I, although I'd had this cancer diagnosis, I at the same time was diagnosed with infertility. Yeah. And in the beginning, of course, dealing with the cancer was was more important. But I kind of see it as like with the cancer part of it. You know, I started treatment. I had the debulking surgery, and that chapter was kind of closed. Like I felt victim to the cancer, and I felt like there was nothing I could do. I still feel like that. There's just nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. But with the infertility side of it, I felt like it really crept up on me more, Mm. and no one ever talked to me about it. No one, it just was unimportant at the time. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, a book that I'm just starting to read. And I know that there's going to be hard parts of it, but they just haven't happened yet. And I don't know what they're going to be. Right. Because how old are um, you now, Rich? I'm 26. Okay. So this was yeah, three years so. ago that you had the surgery. So what is it... How did it affect your cancer aside, I guess? Yeah. How did that the hysterectomy affect you? Does that mean you immediately start the menopause cycle? Or like how does yes. that do your body? <laughs> yeah. So I was thrusted into menopause. I started it in the hospital when I woke up. And I have to say, obviously, I didn't really know a lot about menopause. But now looking back, I would tell all of my friends to be nice to your mom um, because (laughs) menopause sucks. And I was having horrible, horrible hot flashes and mood swings. I really just didn't want to be touched by anyone, not even, I didn't want a blanket on me. Mm -hmm. It was just really uncomfortable. And how long would that last? Mine lasted for, I would say the worst of it was about a year, but I still, I had hot flashes for a really long time. So just like probably constantly or did they like come and go or? They would come and go just randomly. So I would never know when I would have one. And then I would get it really bad at night as well. Mm -hmm. That was probably the worst. I would sleep with my apartment as cold as I could physically make it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I tried to take some medication for the menopause symptoms, but it ended up just making me feel nauseous all the time. So it wasn't yeah, that was my th- you read my mind. It. That was my next question was did they put you on hormone therapy or anything like that to try to level it all out? So because of the, the medication, type, I think that the original medication that I took was maybe venlafaxine, uh-huh. I think was what it was called, I think. But because of the type of cancer I had, I couldn't go on to hormone therapy. That's typically what they do after a hysterectomy is they'll give women some type of hormone therapy or estrogen supplements, something like that. Mm. Estrogen is food for my cancer. Oh, wow. Interesting. So so I couldn't have any hormone therapy. I couldn't take estrogen supplements. And so they, <laughs> which was, which sucks. So I really couldn't level things out at right, all. Right. Hold that thought, guys. If you're anything like me, your beauty and skincare routines have probably changed quite a bit over the past year. Thankfully, I found a new beauty brand that helps me look and feel my best, even if I'm just on Zoom calls. Thrive Cosmetics offers high-performance, award-winning products that are both vegan and cruelty-free. Plus, for every product you purchase, they donate to help a woman thrive. I love that. Thrive Cosmetics products are made with high-performance, skin-loving ingredients. Their clinically proven formulas highlight your best features and improve your skin over time. Plus, their products are formulated without parabens, sulfates, and phthalates. Okay, let's talk about their mascara. You've probably heard about Thrive Cosmetics Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara, which is sold every five seconds and has nearly 12,000 five-star reviews. It's also an Allure Best of Beauty Award winner. The mascara is really cool because it looks like you're wearing lash extensions, but you don't have the glue or the expensive salon prices. Plus, it actually supports longer 
stronger, and healthier looking lashes over time. It's flake free, smudge free, and clump free. Every time I wear it, I feel like I'm wearing fake lashes, but I'm not. A few more things. Thrive is 100% vegan and cruelty free. They never test on animals. They are Leaping Bunny and PETA certified, and they have this awesome program called Bigger Than Beauty, which means that for every product purchased, Thrive Cosmetics helps women in need by donating funds and products to help them thrive. All right, guys, so start thriving and help women in need today by going to thrivecosmetics.com slash infertile AF for 15% off your first purchase. That's Thrive. C-A-U-S-E medics.com slash infertile AF for 15% off. Thanks, Thrive. Hold that thought. Guys, I'm not sure if you know this, but I'm really religious about recycling and doing whatever I can to protect the environment. I even went the entire year of 2020 without buying any new clothes. I mean, it helped that we were in a pandemic, but still. Um, So I'm so excited to tell you that I finally found tree-free toilet paper that gets delivered directly to my door and that I actually love. Cloud Paper was created with a mission to protect the environment and reduce our carbon footprint by making simple changes. Cloud Paper toilet paper actually feels really good, meaning it's not scratchy on your booty, it's sustainable, and it's delivered right to your door, and it's less than a dollar per roll with the code I'm about to give you. Let me tell you guys a little bit more. Cloud paper is not made from trees. It's made from ultra soft bamboo, which is a super quick growing grass. And their three ply TP is soft, strong, and lint free. So you don't have to sacrifice quality for sustainability. It's awesome because not only is the toilet paper itself good for the environment, but their packaging is also 100% plastic free, recyclable, and compostable. Even the wrapping uses soy-based ink. With subscription options to fit your home, your order will be shipped free of charge and get delivered right to your door. You can try it and cancel for free at any time. Also, and I love this part, Cloud Paper partners with Food Lifeline, and they've donated more than 100,000 rolls of Cloud Paper toilet paper to date. I mean, isn't this just dreamy? You definitely want to check this stuff out, guys. Go to cloudpaper.co and use code infertile AF to get 15% off your very first order. That's cloudpaper.co and the code infertile AF for 15% off. Thanks, Cloudpaper. Oh my gosh, that must have been awful. Yeah, it's it was it sucked. So um, this is affecting every part of your life, right? Like were you working? Were you dating anybody? Like what was going on in your day to day? Yeah, I I was working. It didn't really affect my my work too much. They were great about it. I did have a boyfriend at the time that I was diagnosed. And we ended up breaking up shortly after, maybe a few months after I got diagnosed for just unrelated reasons. Mm-hmm. So I was like sick and dealing with recovery at the time. So it was just... And it was already kind of not working out. Mm-hmm. So we never really had to deal with it at all. Mm-hmm. Our, the relationship was already just... It was basically already done. Okay. But yeah, I just... I mean, I, I tried to, to hide it, I would say, as much as I could. And in the beginning, and still sometimes I felt very like ashamed and embarrassed about it. Mm. But I mean... And what about in terms of support? Were you able to find any... Buddy, I mean, this is not common for someone who's 23, 24, you know, to be going through. So mm-hmm. did you find any like groups or were you able to talk to anybody? I wasn't. And that's, that was really the hardest part was I felt very alone. I felt very like debilitated by the infertility diagnosis. And I felt very overlooked by everyone because I was young. That's what everyone kept saying is oh, you're young. You'll be fine. You're young. You're young. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really matter (laughs) that I was young looking back. And they didn't really give me access to any resources. I knew that resources existed, but I felt like it was, where's Waldo? Mm -hmm. (laughs) They made made it really hard to find them. Good analogy. Um, (laughs) I, I knew that they were out there, but yeah, they didn't give me easy access to anything. And even with a lot of the support groups, I remember them saying, well, 
you know, we don't know if it would make sense because you're going to be a lot younger than everyone else, Mm -hmm. especially with like the cancer too. They're like, you know, most of these women are post-menopause, like Mm -hmm. maybe like in their 60s. So you're going to be the odd man out. And cool. Thanks. Yeah. It was like, perfect. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. I'll just bottle this up. Um, But no, I, I got really depressed. Yeah. And I didn't know how to deal with the way that I was feeling. And I was like really desperate for someone to talk to or some type of community. And that's actually how I found your podcast is I was desperately searching for anything. I'm, mm-hmm. I've never really been much of a podcast listener, mm-hmm. but I finally stumbled upon it when I was searching. And yeah, I just beforehand was like, why is nobody talking about this? Because yeah. I know that a lot of people are dealing with this and it feels like I'm in some kind of secret society. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening and I'm glad that it helped you. So tell me about, you said that you feel like you're just starting to read the infertility book. So what does that look like to you? Yeah. So it's interesting because it doesn't really affect my life right now. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to have kids. I'm mm-hmm. I'm single. So it it feels like kind of just a sh- someone standing over my shoulder. I know that I'm going to have to deal with this and it could be something that is very hard, but I just don't know exactly how it's going to play out. So mm-hmm. it, that's why it really feels like I'm I'm reading a book and I know that there's going to be some crazy chapters up ahead. Um, right. You and but, you, you got some good analogies. That's, oh, yeah. thanks. <laughs> um, I was, but I yeah, was, was going to say, <laughs> were you? Okay. I was going to say, it's it's got to be this like low key, looming, almost like sense of impending, not doom, but just shit. It's going to yeah. suck when you event, you know, when you eventually start to go down that road, you know, it's, I mean, not that there can't be a happy ending, obviously, but it's going to be hard. Yeah, it, it's going to be shit and I'm I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> but I think the the main way that it affects me right now is just with dating. Mm-hmm. Um dating knowing that you're infertile is kind of weird. Right. I'm um, sure it doesn't come up on like the first date or the first <laughs> couple no, days, yeah. right? Yeah, it has not- it come up at all with anybody you've been dating? Yes, I've I've told people before, and I haven't really seriously dated anyone honestly since my diagnosis, probably for this reason. But it's not great first date conversation, right? But I never know when to tell someone, mm-hmm. and I I obviously don't want to tell someone on a first date. That would be kind of alarming. But with that said. If I start dating someone and then we're dating for a few months, it starts to, for some reason, feel like a secret right. that I'm keeping. And I know that is kind of none of their business, but at the same time, just feels like some dirty little secret that I have. Yeah, um, that makes total sense. Yeah. And I think I'm, I, I get nervous to tell people because for whatever reason, the stigma around it it does feel kind of like embarrassing or I feel kind of ashamed or I feel guilty, um, mm. which I shouldn't. Why do you think you feel that way? Because obviously this is not your fault. I I think that it's just something I always grew up thinking I would have a family. And I think there's this perception that that's like my duty or my job. Mm-hmm. And if I can't do that, then I'm damaged goods or something, or no one, no guy would want to date me because of this, mm-hmm. or no guy would want to deal with this, which I know obviously is not true. Yeah. I mean, but, you obviously can still have a family. It's just not in the way that you thought that you were going to originally. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And as much as I try to run away from that like false narrative or, the, or that that false stigma, I feel like it's it does still kind of creep up on me mm-hmm. and I feel just a little, I, I can feel a little insecure about it. Yeah. Even though I know it's, it's not the truth. No, I know. For I, some reason it still lives in my, in my head. Right. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be feeling that way. I mean, you feel all the oh, feels yeah. obviously. Oh yeah. <laughs> but obviously also it's not your fault. So 
you know, if, if anything, hopefully we can help people that might be listening that are going through something similar, like this is just shitty situation. You know, it's, there's nothing that you did. It wasn't the heart attack burger. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, but I'm sorry that you're dealing with this. So tell me, what have you learned so far about for your fertility? Like, are you, I know you're not really starting to explore options yet for family building, but mm. what do you think if you do go down that road, what road do you think you'll go down? Yeah. Well, you know, I really wasn't given any resources, so I didn't know what my options were. Mm-hmm. And that's, to be honest, like I've learned everything that I know from your podcast about what my options oh, are. Oh God, that scares me. <laughs> no, no, not it's a good. Medical... No, no. I'm no, glad they... that you've heard other people's stories, but obviously yeah. I always have to say this is not medical. Like some of the stuff we say, I'm sure is wrong. You know, it's just... But thank you for, for yeah. listening. No, I just had absolutely no idea what even was available or I didn't know anything really. Mm-hmm. And so my options are, a, I would say a little bit more limited. So I I can't carry, mm-hmm. of course. I, I can't get pregnant in any way. It wouldn't mm-hmm. matter if it was someone else's egg. So I think my options are surrogacy and egg donation or adoption. Mm-hmm. and. It's funny because pre-diagnosis, to be honest, I never would have considered adoption. It just Mm -hmm. wasn't ever on my radar if I Mm -hmm. could have kids biologically. And now I can't imagine doing anything else. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the route that I would most prefer to go down. Mm -hmm. But I would be open-minded to whatever my hopeful future partner wanted as well. So I'm pretty pretty open-minded about it. Right. Well, I guess in terms of just what else have you learned for people who might be listening, is there anything that you like in retrospect, you said there were no symptoms, right? For the the cancer. Is there anything in retrospect that you're like, oh, that might've been a symptom and I just never realized it just in case someone's listening and might be like, hmm, maybe I should get that checked out, you know? Yeah. I think that the the beef that I have with the medical community or really just society as a whole is that a lot of these symptoms can be overlooked and I may have been having symptoms, but as women, you know, if you have, not always, but a lot of time, if you're having really bad periods or if you're having weird symptoms, people just kind of say, suck it up. You're just Mm -hmm. supposed to suck it up. You take three Advil and you still go to school. Right. Um, it doesn't matter if you can't walk because your period cramps are so bad. Uh-huh. And I feel like I kind of had that scenario. I had always had weird weird periods. Like I one time went two years without having one in high school. I also had PCOS, which mm-hmm. I, sh- I didn't mention. But I never knew to look deeper into anything or I just thought, you know, you just zip it and you, you, you toughen up. And... To anyone that, and I, I don't want to ever freak anyone out because I feel like a lot of my friends are like, oh my God, do I have ovarian cancer? Because mm-hmm. I had some stomach pain last week. And I would say most of the time it's probably nothing, but listen to your gut. Mm-hmm. So if you feel like something's off, make them double check whatever it may be that they need to do. Make them do it. Don't let anyone overlook you if you feel like something is off or you're having really horrible symptoms, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We always talk about be your own advocate, right? I mean, there's, yeah, doctors are amazing and wonderful, but they don't know everything and they, they can't, they don't know how you're feeling. And if you're having, like you said, some sort of pain or a gut feeling that something's off, definitely, definitely get it checked out and don't stop until you get answers. And maybe the answer is nothing and that's wonderful, Mm. but maybe it's not. Yeah. And then I think to just anyone dealing with infertility, just you're not alone. (laughs) You're not alone and you shouldn't feel ashamed. And I think we should all be talking about it. Okay, guys, thanks so much for listening to my conversation with Rachel. And Rachel, thank you so much for reaching out to me and for sharing all of that. I know you've already helped so many people just by sharing your knowledge and what you went through. So thanks guys for listening. And on another note, Fertility Rally Live is happening on April 17th. So it is a full day 
education and celebration for the infertility community and beyond people who love them. So we would love for you guys to join us. Tickets are on sale now at at fertilityrally.com. We have an early bird for the next week or so, early bird price, and then it goes up to our regular prices. But even if you can't make it live, you get access to the entire event for more than 30 days afterwards. So it is all day speakers, breakout sessions, covering everything from surrogacy to embryo adoption to being plus sized in the infertility world to couples, to women of color, to being childless, not by choice. We really tried to make it as diverse as possible. So we would love for you guys to join us. DM or email me if you have any questions and check out fertilityrally.com. All right. Thanks so much. Talk to you next time.